Let's pray. Lord, we do indeed give you thanks and praise for your word, and we thank you especially for the Gospels which tell us about you, Lord Jesus, about the things that you did while you were here on earth. And we pray that now, by the Holy Spirit who is present here with us, that you will help us to hear with fresh ears, Lord, um, what you want to say to us this morning through, uh, through your word. Please speak into our hearts and into our lives. Shape us to be the people that you want us to be. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, if there's a title for this sermon, then it would be Controversies. Ecclesiastes says that there is a time to mourn and a time to dance. And there is also a time to fast and a time to feast. And we tend to know when these times are. If you get invited to a wedding you expect to feast, or at the very least, to snack. But you don't expect to fast. Uh, in the Christian calendar, we're actually in a season of fasting. Uh, at least uh, historically and traditionally, uh, people have used the 40 days of Lent to, um, to fast. Uh, it might be a total fast, but in general it was to live uh, more simply, to forego richer kinds of food. And the idea was that when you got to the end of the 40 days, then the time of feasting begins with Easter and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We know when feasting and fasting are appropriate. And I want this morning to start in the middle of this chapter, in verses 18 to 22, and, and then later on look at the two sections that surround it. Uh, and this conversation that Jesus has with the disciples about fasting uh, may be a little confusing to us. But in essence, what Jesus is saying is simply this, that they've got the time wrong. That they're, do, they're behaving in a way that's inappropriate to the particular time, the particular moment that they were in at that time. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Have you, are you one of those people who's forgotten to change the clocks, either to move them forward or backwards? And, uh, you know, you've turned up at church and it's the end of the service, or you've turned up an hour early and you've wondered what in the world's going on. It can be very confusing if you uh, lose track of time. Uh, it can be very confusing if you sleep over, you know, sleep beyond your alarm clock. Uh, and suddenly you wake up with a start to have uh, to have. Uh, that experience of losing track of time can be very difficult. The Pharisees fasted twice a week and John's disciples were also fasting in anticipation and preparation for the coming of God's Messiah. But Jesus says, it's the wrong time. The Messiah is already here. The time is now. This is not the time for fasting. This is the time for feasting. And in reply to the question and implied challenge about fasting, Jesus is simply saying that it's a time to feast and not a time to fast because the king's here, the Messiah is here, it's party time. God's kingdom is here, the revolution has begun. The idea of a feast as a picture of God's kingdom is deeply embedded in the Old Testament. There are several passages in Isaiah which draw on that idea that when God's rule and God's reign is going to be like a big feast. It's going to be a celebration. It's a time. And Jesus is drawing on that and saying to them, no, this is not the time for fasting. This is the time for feasting. And he then uses two parables to illustrate this radically new time, this radically new thing that he was bringing. And he says, no one repairs old clothes with a patch from something new. Well, actually, I think they do now, but in those days they didn't. You know, it's sort of quite trendy, isn't it? We're going to patch this up with this and this and this and make something new out of it. That would not have been the way it was in that particular day. Or you wouldn't put new wine in an old wineskin because our old wineskins got brittle and the new wine was full of life and was fizzing and it could just possibly burst the skins open. The old cannot be patched up. It must be replaced. Jesus had not come to patch up the old way, but rather to bring in something new. It's new but it's new in continuity with, and it fulfills that which is gone, but it's still new. It's radically new. The picture 
of the wineskins is often used in association with renewal movements within the church. You'll, there's uh, several books that I could quote with titles that have got to do with new wine and wineskins and all sorts of things. And they're about renewal movements within the church. And it's true that when God moves and his kingdom is seen in the lives and actions of his people, we experience it as something new. It won't be new revelation, let's be clear about that. We're not going to have new revelation that supplants or surpasses what's there in Scripture. It's always going to be true to what's already been revealed in the Bible. But the new, it'll still feel new to us as God renews things. It will be different in different times and in different places. So what's renewal here in Hartlepool might not necessarily be what's renewal in parts of Africa or Latin America or Asia. However, and it may be part of Mark's purpose in recording these events, it will be controversial. It will be controversial. The five stories that we have read and looked at this morning from Mark 2 verse 1 through to 3 verse 6 are held together by the controversy that they provoke. In each story, in each account, it's about controversy. Jesus does something or says something and someone challenges it and someone is provoked by it. But note that even those who challenge, oppose and plot against Jesus had to acknowledge that we have never seen anything like this. At the end of the story that I told you, in verse 12, they all said, we have never seen anything like this. Even the ones who were prov provoking Jesus, those who were challenging Jesus said, we've never seen anything like this. We don't know what to make of it, but we don't like it. <laughs> We know we don't like it, but we don't know what to make it. We've not seen anything like it. The uh, American pastor, Tim Keller, who died last year, used to talk about how the church should always surprise because our views seem contradictory to the watching world. He said hey, we should always be challenging um, the world around us because actually the things that we believe don't fit neatly into the categories that people want to put, to put them. And I, I suppose his illustrations particularly applies to, to America, where he was talking about some of the moral issues like abortion and sexual ethics and those kind of things, but also about the call to be caring for the poor and, and reaching out to the marginalized and for racial justice and all of those kind of things. And he was saying, the package seems odd, it's challenging to the world because they, they think it should be just like this or just like that. And so we are called, when God is at work within us, we're going to find that it's going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging for us, but it will be confusing for the world. We've never seen anything like this, is the, is the, if you like, is the response that we want to provoke. So let's move on to think about the controversies that Mark records for us. The first two, in Mark 2, verses 1 to 17, are about sin and sinners. The kingdom of God is breaking in in the person of Jesus. And when it comes, forgiveness, healing, and acceptance of even tax collectors and sinners, of all sorts of people who have been excluded, who've been told, you don't belong and you can never belong. There isn't really a way back. But now in Jesus, that's changing. And the story of the lame man should not be read as suggesting that all sickness is directly the result of sin. We shouldn't read it like that. That is not the message. Think about John chapter 9 where Jesus distinctly says that about the blind man. You know, because they're asking the question, whose fault was it, his or his parents? And Jesus said, that's, that's nothing to do with it. Think about Job. We have a whole book in the Bible that is dealing with um, the, the suffering that is not justified. But the Bible is clear that sickness, disease and death are the consequences of the sinful condition of all people. Disease and death exist in our world because of sin, because we human beings rebelled against our creator. And in this story, Jesus is dealing with the root cause of all our problems by forgiving the sin of the man. The healing acts as a confirmation 
that he has the authority to forgive, that he has the authority to actually deal with the real issue, the issue of sin in the heart of a human being. And the onlooking doubters are thinking he's blaspheming. And Jesus, in response to their unspoken thoughts, asks a question, which is easier to heal or to forgive. What do you think the answer to that question is? Which is easier to heal or to forgive? And the answer is to forgive. That's the hard thing. That was the hard thing. To forgive. Forgiveness is both more essential and more difficult and more costly. And perhaps in our culture we get this wrong, that it's an easy thing for God to forgive. I think there was some philosopher who once said that's God's job to forgive. And perhaps we get lulled into a sense that it's an easy thing for God to forgive, or that's what God does. But that's not the case. And that story that we looked at earlier is followed by the account of the call of Levi. If you've ever been involved in planning a wedding, you'll realise just how controversial it can be drawing up the guest list. (laughs) You know, there's got to be a cut-off point somewhere, unless you're a multi-billionaire who can afford to just invite everybody that you remotely know. Most of us are not in that situation. I know that there was trauma for all of my daughters because uh, the limited budget that they were given by their parents for deciding who would, could be invited to this wedding. And you know, Jesus was constantly running into trouble because of, the people, because of the people on his guest list, the people who he partied with. And calling Levi and then joining him for a party was looked upon with abhorrence by his critics. They asked his disciples, why did he do such a thing? And Jesus responds with a proverb. And the proverb is, you know, it's there in um, verse 17. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I remember when uh, I was going to see the doctor, when I first realized I was suffering from depression. And I went in, and it wasn't my normal doctor. And it was a young doctor, and he was really, really lovely. Uh, But he gave me advice and choices And I was in such a low state, I just could not deal with it. And I remember that I went in and I I spoke to him. And as I say, he was really, really lovely. But when I went outside the surgery on the street, I just burst into tears. I just couldn't cope. I just felt like I'd had no help whatsoever. So a a couple of days later, I went back and saw my own doctor. And he was an old-fashioned kind of doctor. And he just told me what we were going to (laughs) do. You see, I needed intervention. I didn't need advice. I needed someone to intervene, not someone to give me six things that might help me be sorted out. And these first two controversies highlight our spiritual condition. We do not require good advice. We require radical intervention. We don't need 12 rules for living. We need a saviour who can deal radically with our sin and bring healing to the deepest parts of our lives. Forgiveness is not easy for God. He had to come in the person of Jesus to deal with sin by taking all our sin and our brokenness upon himself at the cross and dying for us, dying the death that we deserved. He didn't come to manage our symptoms. He didn't come to give us advice. He came to heal the sickness of sin that blights our lives. And many people didn't like it then and wouldn't accept it. And it's actually the same today. People don't want to hear that they have a radical problem that needs a saviour. There isn't any management system. There isn't anything that we can live for that is going to sort it out. Only Jesus can do it. And then the second area of controversy is to do with the Sabbath. And in these two incidents, Jesus challenges the contemporary view of the Sabbath. It seems that over time, good and often godly people had added layers and layers of definition to the keeping of Sabbath. And Jesus' challenge is twofold. That what God had given as a good gift to be life-giving had increasingly become a burden crushing life from people. So when, when God... You know, Sabbath was part of creation. 
God created Sabbath for our blessing, for fullness of life. And what has happened over time as people have tried to define what it meant to keep the Sabbath, they've built up layers and layers and layers of rules so that now they were, people were just crushed because they had so many things to keep an eye on, so many rules to keep in order to keep, it, keep the Sabbath holy that it actually lost all its point. And then the second thing that Jesus says is that the Sabbath was given for human flourishing. But doing good to people was increasingly seen as secondary to keeping the rules. That's what's in the story of the man with the hand, the withered hand. Jesus is challenging them. Can you do good on the Sabbath? Because this is why the Sabbath has been given. It's been given for good and for blessing. And when Jesus declared himself Lord of the Sabbath in verse 28, he's saying that all the Sabbath was supposed to be about is fulfilled in him. That this rest that is the promise of Sabbath is now available in him. As we come to him, this is life-giving, that Jesus is life-giving. And we mustn't be too hard on the religious leaders. Many of them simply wanted to know how to please God. They wanted to know how they could live and please God and live faithfully before him. And if, if, you're, if you are a person who wants to please God, you want to have an idea what to do, don't you? You want to have some sort of sense of what are the kind of things I need to do in order to live and please God. And I think that's where the challenge of this particular controversy lies for us. The reason that Margaret and I are away at the weekend is it's our 38th wedding anniversary on Friday. And um, Margaret and I have learned how to be together over 38 years. We've learned how to manage money together because she's a saver and I'm a spender. <laughs> We've managed to uh, learn how to resolve disagreements. I just do what Margaret says. <laughs> We've learned how to organize domestic duties so that these are the things that Margaret does and these are the things that I do over the years. And they change. And they are rules, but they're not written down. If you go in our kitchen, they're not stuck to the fridge saying, this is the rule, this is the law. They're written, unwritten and they're often unspoken, but they're rules, if you like, which keep our relationship healthy, that keep our relationship functioning well. But you know something, if all we do is keep the rules and lose the sweet joy of being together, enjoying loving friendship, the rules simply become a burden. They no longer give life. And I think that's what had happened to the Sabbath, and this is what Jesus was saying. You know, you've lost the joy of the relationship that God has called you into. And in a similar way, I think, our relationship with God needs rules and boundaries to maintain its life and integrity. But if we lose our focus on the one who's called us into relationship with him, we may actually begin to mistake the keeping of the rules for the maintaining of a healthy relationship. And we do need to think through for ourselves how to live faithfully. And it's going to look different for each one of us because we face different challenges. We have different personalities. We have different areas of vulnerability and weakness and temptation. You know, we're going to have to think about how we personally go about maintaining sexual purity. How we personally go about maintaining healthy relationships in our attitudes towards one another. How we how we personally are going to live graciously and generously, how we're going to maintain our close relationship with God. And it's going to look different in, in, in across, the, across the room for each one of us. But doing that must never become the end in itself. The end is God. The end is fellowship, communion with the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we are called to. This is the privilege of who we are. This is why Jesus came to radically change our hearts, not just to give us advice. And the new thing that Jesus came to inaugurate, the rule of God in our lives is life-giving, life liberating, and joy-filled. But it will be and is controversial. And it's opposed. And we must guard our hearts and we must guard our minds and we must seek first the kingdom of God. And there are signs that God is moving. 
much of what we're experiencing in the church at this time it's new to me it might not be new to you but a lot of what i'm experiencing at the moment is new to me i haven't known a season like this one and the challenge for us is not to try to contain the new in the old not to think that all god wants to do is to patch us up this genuinely could be a moment of blessing and harvest not just for, for us, but for many other churches in our town. So let's guard our hearts. Because whenever God is at work, you can be sure the enemy is at work. That there's going to be controversy. That there's going to be things that unsettle us. And we're going to have to bear with one another in love through those, those things and those situations. So let's... Let's now just take a moment, let's think, reflect, invite God the Holy Spirit perhaps just to highlight something for you this morning that he wants to say to you, something that he wants to perhaps comfort you with, something that he may want to challenge you with. Lord, we thank you that you are here and present through the Holy Spirit this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, when you walked on this earth, you provoked controversy by the good that you did. Thank you, Lord, that that prepares us to expect the same. And Lord, we want to, to thank you for the new things that you're doing in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to embrace those things and help us to walk faithfully before you in this time. Lord, thank you that you have provided a radical solution to the problem of sin. And Lord, that no matter how bad we might feel that we've been or how far we might feel that we are from you, Lord, there is a way back because of all that you have done. Thank you that you came not to give us advice, but you came to intervene. You came to change the situation, to change our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would help us to nurture the relationship that you have called us into. Through the Holy Spirit, may we learn how to walk with you more faithfully Lord, have your way, we pray. And do your work in us and in this church in order that the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified and his name might be lifted high in this town. For we pray it in his name, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen.